Okay, today we're going to talk about the terrifying reality of hell. Uh, there's a lot of people out there that think that hell is something that you have to believe in by faith. Not true. Hell is a scientific reality. Science, by the way, is testable, observable, demonstrable. And I'm going to show to you today that the only thing that is faith-based as far as hell is concerned is the thing of having to believe that a soul could go down there and burn forever without burning up. That's the only thing that I can't demonstrate about hell. Everything else about hell can be experienced here on earth for a short time. You know, the person dies. Uh, the eternity of hell can't be experienced, but everything else can. So we're going to start out in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6. I'm going to show you here what hell should mean to a Christian. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 6. That's where we'll start. Okay, it says here, Therefore we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Wherefore we labor, that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of Him, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that every one may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Let me just stop there for one minute. What are you receiving for? The things done. Well, what's that called? Works. Your works are what is judged at the judgment seat of Christ. You aren't judged there. Okay, your works, what you've done in your body, the time that you've spent. Verse 9 there talks about wherefore we labor, the work that you do as a Christian. Now look at verse 11. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. I'm not going to read the rest of the verse there, but that's very significant. What is the terror of the Lord? Well, that's what we're going to talk about today, the terror of hell, the fact that it is a reality. Turn to Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10, verse 28. We're going to see about this issue of fear and terror. Matthew 10, 28 says, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. So it's talking about, in context there, if you read the context, that's talking about the Lord. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Are you to fear God? Yes, you are. I mean, you've got to think about who you're dealing with. You know, Over in Colossians chapter 1, it talks about all things were created by Jesus Christ, and by Him all things consist. In other words, if the Lord says... You're not going to live any longer. There is nothing you can do about it. By Him, all things consist. Our life is dependent on God. Your breath, your food, your health, everything is dependent on whether God says, I want you to have that or not. And these people that say, well, I just, you know, I can't imagine why a loving God would send people to hell. Well, think about it. Who, who owns this earth? God does. The Bible says the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Everything in the earth belongs to God. Why wouldn't you want to give Him glory, your Creator? And yet, how many people give God glory with their life? Very few. How many people really want to get to know their Creator? Most try to deny Him. Most try to come up with systems to explain away the existence of God. Isn't that sad? Matthew chapter 18, a couple chapters forward here. Matthew chapter 18, verse 7. I see something else here. It's very interesting. Matthew chapter 18, verse 7 says, Woe unto the world because of offenses, for it, not, it, excuse me, for it must needs be that offenses come, but woe to that man by whom the offense cometh. Um, why do offenses come? Because God gives man free will. That's another argument people have against God. They say, if there's a loving God, why is there evil in the world? Because He gives people the right to choose. 
God does not force His ways on people. He says, I've given you life. You're on my planet, breathing my air, eating my food, but I'm going to let you do what you want with your life. And that's why sometimes you'll hear sermons on hell and the preacher's up there screaming and yelling at you. I'm not going to do that today. You know why? Because I don't want to force you into a decision that's not real. I don't want you getting, quote unquote, saved through emotion. You know, you have to come to a point where you realize you're a sinner before a holy God, not before me. I'm not going to be able to to send you one place or another. All I'm doing is just telling you what the Bible says. Okay, you're going to have to stand before God one day and he will give you the right to do what you want with your life. But let's continue here. Verse eight. Wherefore, if thy hand or thy foot offend thee, cut them off and cast them from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life halt or maimed rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into everlasting fire. And if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hellfire. That's not the plan of salvation. Okay, You do not have to amputate your hand or your foot or pluck out one of your eyes. It's just simply saying hell is such a horrible place that you would be better off cutting off part of your body if that's what's keeping you from being saved. All right, You don't have to do that to be saved. just want to make that point clear. You say, well, I don't know if people would ever take that kind of drastic action. Well, actually, I have here an article. This is um, August 9th, 1993, People Magazine. just going to read the first two paragraphs here. I won't read the whole thing. And uh, this is going to be kind of graphic, so get ready for it. We're on a graphic subject today. In the still of the evening, the only sound was the lowing of the cows, and then came the screams. Outside his barn, dairy farmer John Huber Jr. saw a mud-spattered truck. Uh, behind the wheel was a man who appeared to be stark raving mad. I cut my leg off, the man was bellowing. I cut my leg off. Cautiously approaching the Chevy S10, Huber watched the frantic driver struggle to raise his left leg into the air. Huber gasped. The leg was a bloody mess, and below the knee it was gone. Help me, the man shouted. I'm bleeding to death. For the stunned Huber, 43, it was the start of a des desperate race to save the life of 37-year-old Donald Wyman. But Wyman, a, bull a burly bulldozer operator, had already waged his own Herculean struggle for survival. Minutes earlier, alone in the western Pennsylvania fo uh, woods, he had been forced to amputate part of his own leg with a three-inch pocket knife. It was his only hope of escaping the huge oak tree that had crushed the leg and pinned him to the ground. Leaving a bloody trail, he crawled 135 feet uphill to his bulldozer, hoisted himself into it, and rumbled 1,500 feet to his pickup. Then, using a metal file to depress the clutch when he shifted, he drove his manual transmission truck a mile and a half to Huber's place. I told myself, it's too early to go out like this. Wyman told People uh, magazine, Days after his July 20th ordeal, I thought I got to get out of this for my family. Would people take desperate action and actually cut part of their body off to save themselves? Yeah. Depending on the situation. I'm not going to read the rest of the story. He lived. He did survive. But his motivation was his family. Okay. Very interesting. He wasn't thinking about himself. He was thinking about his family. Now, we're going to go to Luke chapter 16. I'm going to show you kind of an interesting thing here. Luke chapter 16, verse 19. And you know, that in that story, I didn't read the whole thing there, obviously, but he had no choice. The way he was laying there and everything, he had to make that decision, or else it would have cost his life. But look here at Luke chapter 16, verse 19. Now, this is not a parable. As a lot of people try to say, this is real. Because the Lord always says, now learn a parable before he starts a parable. And he doesn't give you know, names either. Actual names when he, te when he tells a parable. But he gives names here. Verse 19. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores. And desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, moreover the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. 
Uh, verse 23, And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. Now, this is a very important thing here. A couple of things you have to notice. Number one, is hell above ground or underground? It's underground. All right. Now, in the Old Testament, because the blood of Jesus Christ was not yet available to wash away their sins, their sins could be forgiven because of sacrificing the blood of bulls and goats and things, but their sins weren't taken away until Jesus died on the cross. So back then, they had to go down to another place down there that was not, they weren't burning, they were sleeping down there. So you have a different situation here. The, the Old Testament saints were not burning, they were in this place called Abraham's bosom. But the people in hell were over across, we're going to see that here in a minute, and they could see the people over there resting, waiting for the Lord to come for them. Now let's see some of the conditions here of hell. Look at uh, verse 24. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Now, just let me stop there for one second too. The Jehovah's Witnesses try to, to say that hell is the grave. You're not tormented in flames when you are in the grave. Okay? You know, that doesn't work. But let's continue. Verse 25. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. All right, so you see there, one of the conditions of hell is that there's no water down there. And it's, it's torment. And back then, now this does not exist anymore. We're going to see that as we continue. But back then, you had the Old Testament saints in one area, and then you had the people in hell in another area. And there was a great gulf between the two, like a big ravine or a canyon, basically, is what that would be. They couldn't pass from one to the other. Uh, let's continue here. Verse 27. Now look at this. Remember what the this logger guy, this uh, bulldozer operator, what was his motivation for cutting his leg off? His family. What does somebody in hell think about? Are they down there saying, I don't deserve to be here. This isn't fair. Why would a loving God send me here? There's no more question about that. You know, I'm going to offend some people here, but oh well. Uh, this past month, all you've seen on the news or, you know, it's all over the internet everywhere you go. Whitney Houston died. Whitney Houston died. You know where she is? Hell. You know, oh, how do you know that? She was a good person. She lived on alcohol and drugs and partied for the last 10 years. When did she ever confess Jesus Christ openly? When did she ever fall out of favor with the, the whole secular world? If she was really truly born again, do you think that they would have eulogized her the way they did? No. And what's Whitney Houston thinking right now in hell? Is she down there going, oh, I wonder where I'm at right now? I, you know, no. You know what her will is? Her wish is? We're going to see it right here. And anybody who's unsaved that is in hell, this is their wish. Verse 27. Then he said, I pray thee, therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. Let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Now that Whitney Houston thing, I'm using that as just an example here. She has a daughter. She has a young teenage daughter. I bet you she's down in hell right now saying, please, somebody, somebody get to my daughter. I don't want her coming here. That's something else you need to think about. You say, well, I have, I have loved ones that probably are in hell. They never were Christians or anything. You know, I'd like to go down there to see them. No, you're not going to see them down there. And even if you could, there's not going to be some time of sweet fellowship, you know, reunion or something like that. Nope. And they don't want you coming there. Why? Because hell's a horrible place. 
And the fact that these modern preachers aren't talking about it, probably because a lot of them are going there. Had this guy come out, you know, Rob Bell, and he said that everybody's eventually going to make it to heaven. How do you get that from here? We're going to see that today. The Bible's crystal clear. There are people that are going to go to hell. And the Bible teaches that the way to hell is broad and many there be which go in there at. The majority of people are going to this horrible place. And I want to tell you about that today so you don't have to go there. I love you enough to tell you the truth. Turn next to Acts chapter 2. If you remember what I said, Old Testament saints had to go to this place called Abraham's bosom because the blood of Jesus Christ was not yet there to wash their sins away. So we'll go to Acts chapter 2, verse 25. And here you have Peter preaching, and he actually quotes part of the Old Testament. Acts chapter 2, verse 25. Okay, it says here, For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand, that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover, also my flesh shall rest in hope. Because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine Holy One to see corruption. Now, David was talking about himself. His soul went down there to this chamber, which in the Old Testament, a lot of times it was just called hell. All right, they went down to that same place. Technically, it was another chamber down there. It wasn't the fires of hell. But the point is, his soul went down there to rest until Jesus Christ came. But this is also a prophetic reference to Jesus Christ. Thine holy one to see corruption. You know, Jesus Christ did not go down there and rot or anything like that. No. When he died and was buried, his soul went down to that place. And we're going to see that. I'm getting ahead of myself. But that, if you want to look up the Old Testament reference there, it's Psalm 16 verses 8 through 10 is what Peter is quoting here. So now the question comes up, you said, well, well, earlier you said about hell is a scientific reality. Well, if it is, then we should be able to tell where it's located, right? Where is hell? Turn to Matthew chapter 12. We're going to be doing a lot of flipping around in our Bibles today. It's usually what we do here because we are Bible believers. I'm not going to just stand up here and, and run my mouth for an hour. You know, I want you to see what the Scripture says, because this is the authority, not me. Matthew chapter 12, verse 39. That's where we're going to go. Okay, it says here, But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Why was Jesus down in the heart of the earth? Because that's where hell is. That's where it's at. And um, we're not going to turn here for sake of time, but First Peter chapter 3, verses 18 and 19 says, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. Okay, that's talking about when he died and was buried and went down there to that Abraham's bosom area. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20, But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. Uh, he was the first one to come up in that resurrection. You can read about that. Uh, we have a whole sermon on... Uh, the resurrection and the you know death and resurrection and things. But the point is, he went down to the heart of the earth, down to that place where we read about there in Acts chapter two, where it said that hell is, you know, where where David went. Thou wilt not leave my soul in hell. So you see those two scriptures tie together. So where is hell? In the heart of the earth. Now, you say, well, I don't know. You you said about science. Well, right here. You can go to google.com and you can type in heart of the earth or earth's core and these are just five pictures. Okay? And what we have here is 
uh, some pictures, some drawings of the earth. And, you know, it's cut open and everything. And uh, the first one is from astrobio.net. The next is geo, the, thegeoguy.com. The next is nationalgeographic.com. The next one is dailymail.co.uk. And then the last one there is sciencedaily.com. All right. And, you know, and there were hundreds of these. I just picked five of them. All of them show what? As the heart of the earth. A molten liquid mass. Well, what does the Bible describe hell as? A lake of fire? Well, I don't know if you can really believe in hell. I don't really know if you can scientifically prove it. Right there, secular science says that hell, they wouldn't call it hell. You know, it's the inner core. Okay? But it's exactly as the Bible describes it. It's no, there's no contradiction between the Bible and quote-unquote science there. Geology. Now, I want to show you something else that's interesting here. Look over at Matthew chapter 13, verse 41. Matthew chapter 13, verse 41 says, The Son of Man shall send forth His angels, and they shall gather out of His kingdom all things that offend, and them which do iniquity, and shall cast them into a furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Jump down to verse 47. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a net that was cast into the sea and gathered of every kind, which when it was full they drew to shore and sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but cast the bad away. So shall it be at the end of the world. The angels shall come forth and sever the wicked from among the just and shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Now we're going to get into the, what is the end of the world here in just a minute, but I want you to notice something. What is hell likened to there? A furnace of fire. Right there we have a wood stove. Okay, that is a furnace of fire. It is designed to contain a fire in the middle and to provide heat for this whole house. All right, now that's very hot. You don't want to go over there and touch it, but it'd be even worse if you actually had to be inside that thing. It'd be horrible. Now, if you look at hell, what do you have hell as? Again, look at the pictures. The fire is within the earth. So technically, it's like a furnace of fire. All right? Pretty interesting. You say, well, wait a second now. That stove right there has a chimney. It has a stove pipe that comes up and out. If hell's real, where are the chimneys at? You know, you can't just have all that heat down there. Where are the chimneys at? Uh, they're called volcanoes. Amen. You know? That's where the heat's coming up at. I mean, where do you think the lava comes from? You know, where do you think that heat's coming from? Do you think there's a little factory underneath the volcano that makes it? No. You know, and it's kind of interesting because the Bible actually talks about hell enlarging itself to make room for more people. Wouldn't that be something if every time a volcano erupted, that was actually hell getting bigger underneath? I can't prove that, but maybe that's what's going on. Pretty wild. You think about all the people that have died without Jesus Christ and back into the Old Testament, you know, when the majority of earth history was in the Old Testament, you know, I mean, you have essentially 4,000 years of history. It's a long time. A lot of people. And God was dealing with one nation, the Jews. How big is hell? How many souls are down there? Could be a lot. But now what about this thing of the end of the world? Matthew chapter 25. Turn over there. Matthew chapter 25, verse 31. Now, there's a lot of, of time that's being covered here. All right? we, this isn't all just you know going to happen in the next year or so. All right? This is not going to happen until sometime in the future. Uh, this is a prophetic part of Scripture. Matthew chapter 25, verse 31. It says here, When the Son of Man shall come in His glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory, and before him shall be gathered all nations, 
and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Remember what we just read about back there in uh, was it Matthew chapter 13, about how that they would they would separate. There's going to be this great separation. Well, there's a time coming, prophetically speaking. If you haven't, if you're not familiar with these sermons that we preach here at Bible Believers Fellowship, prophetically speaking, the next big event will be the rapture of the body of Christ. We're going to be leaving, and then will come a time of God's wrath and judgment upon this world, which is going to last for seven years. All right. At the end of that, Jesus Christ comes back down. Uh, well, he comes down, and we come back down with him. Okay, which I believe they are the holy angels that are with him. The Bible says in the erection we are as the angels of God. So I think that that's a reference to Christians, redeemed saints, all right, incorruptible saints. And we come back down, and Jesus Christ sits on a throne in Jerusalem, which will be the headquarters of this millennial kingdom that's coming. And his saints are going to go out, and we're going to gather all the people that are left here on the earth. We're going to gather them and bring them to Jerusalem. And you say, well, then I'll have a chance. Uh, if you miss the rapture, salvation is going to be extremely difficult. Okay, there's people that say that, you know, they, you know, people think, you know, there's a lot of people out there that, that think that they're going to be able to survive the Antichrist kingdom and stuff. Well, there's a possibility. But, you know, can you really live out in the wilderness for seven years without getting caught? Well, maybe. Maybe. But in, then towards the end of it, if you're still alive, you're going to be gathered. Don't think that you're going to be able to hide out and just kind of pop into the millennial kingdom. You know? <laughs> no, that's not going to happen. You will be gathered and you will be judged at that point. And you go down through there and you see what, how people are judged. But what happens to the goats? Okay, the sheep they go in that are set on the right hand, they go into the millennial kingdom. But what happens to the goats? Look at verse 46. It says here, And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. Everlasting punishment. Oh, well, you know, you'll just go down to hell and you'll burn up and be gone in an hour. Nope. Everlasting. Everlasting punishment. It's going to be bad. Uh, Revelation chapter 20. Is there a judgment that comes after that one? The judgment of the nations. Yes, there is. There's one final judgment after the judgment of nations. Now this one, you, there's no dividing done. This one is for the inhabitants of hell. This is their final judgment before eternity in the lake of fire. All right, verse 11. Revelation 20, verse 11. And I saw a great white throne from him, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were open, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And look at this. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So in other words, the inhabitants of hell are going to get to come out at some point in time. But they get their final judgment. There's no, oh, well, now you have another chance to get saved. Uh-uh. You're just coming out for your final trial, the great white throne, before eternity in the lake of fire. You say, well, you know, do I get a second chance? Yeah, the second death. You know, it's not much of a chance. You know, right now's the time to get saved, I'm telling you. You know, right now's the easiest time to get saved. You can... You can do it in five minutes. Be saved. It's so simple, you know. But now we're going to look at some terrors of hell. And I have six listed here. I'm sure that you could probably make a list of many, many more things that hell is going to be, you know, characteristics of hell. I'm just going to read through these verses here to save some time. How about uh, the first one? No water in hell. 
Now we read about that one earlier, Luke chapter 16, verse 24. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Now, if you've ever done any kind of uh, study into survival types of things, you know that you can only go a couple days without water. You can't say, oh, I'll go for a month or something like that. And I don't know, if anybody here ever had a time where you didn't have water and your mouth just got like really, really dry where you couldn't even swallow? You know, the, here the other week when I was sick, I remember the one night I woke up and it was just like, you know, oh, man, it, my throat was so dry. It was horrible. I couldn't, even, I couldn't even swallow. It was bad. I had to go and get some water and just slowly drink it till I could, you know, swallow the right way. How about for eternity? No water. Ever. While you're being in flames. It's not like, you know, you're just some nice cool place sitting under a tree, you know, and with no water. No. In flames. And this is one people don't often think about. But how about this one? No food in hell. How would you like to be starving? Thirsty and starving. Now, can you experience those things here on earth? Yeah. It doesn't take a stretch of the imagination to, you know, what would it be? What is starving? What is, you know? You can see examples of people that starve to death here on this earth. No faith required. You can scientifically prove that starvation is horrible. It's a bad thing. And I'm going to show you an extreme example of this. And, uh, you know, a lot of people don't like the Bible for stories like this, but oh well. Second Kings chapter 6, verse 24. We're gonna, I'll just read through the verses. And it came to pass after this that Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, gathered all his host and went up and besieged Samaria. And there was a great famine in Samaria. And behold, they besieged it until an ass's head was sold for four score pieces of silver and the fourth part of a cab of dove's dung for five pieces of silver. And as the king of Israel was passing by upon the wall, there cried a woman unto him, saying, Help me, or help my lord, O king. And he said, If the Lord do not help thee, when shall I help thee? Out of the barn floor or out of the wine press? In other words, he's being sarcastic. He's saying, I can't help you. We don't have any food. We don't have any wine. Now look what she says, verse 28. And the king said unto her, What aileth thee? And she answered, The woman said unto me, Give thy son that we may eat him today, and we will eat my son tomorrow. So we boiled my son, and we did, and did eat him. And I said unto her on the next day, Give thy son that we may eat him, and she hath hid her son. Cannibalism? In the Bible? Yeah. The Bible is a book of reality. Okay? You read a lot of these other phony, baloney books out there, the... Quran and the you know the Vedas, the Hindu Vedas and stuff and the all that other junk. You know what it is? It's all just positive man can become God garbage. The Bible tells you about reality. The Bible is a very plain here it is, this is the way humanity is when it things fall apart. You say, Oh I I don't think that could ever happen here in America. It has happened here in America. Did you ever hear of the Donner Pass? You know? People going out west, and they decided, to, you know, a small part of the party broke off and decided to go on a shortcut. They ended up having to eat each other. You say, well, you know, I don't think that, that could happen here, though. Not today. Really? You don't think it could get so bad here? And by the way, that's a, that's a good technique of war. You go in there and you cut off the food supply. How long can the people last? <laughs> that could happen here. I hate to tell you that. Okay, right now we have Russia and China threatening this country. <laughs> oh, they can't come in here. It could get real bad here. But how about in hell? There's no food in hell. And it's not, you know, well, we're being besieged. Eventually we'll just give ourselves up, you know, and go over. Uh, there's no chance. Starvation forever in hell. What a horrible thought. What about no light in hell? Could you be put into a situation where there's no light? Yeah. 
you ever go down into a cave and they shut the lights off? And you can you can put your hand in front of your face and face and you can't see it. What well, does the Bible teach that? Matthew chapter eight verse twelve. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Matthew twenty two thirteen. Then said the king to his the servants, Bind him hand and foot and take him away and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Matthew twenty five verse thirty. And cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Three different references to hell being outer darkness, total darkness. And people say, now now hold on a second here, that doesn't make any sense. You see, because hell is fire, fire produces light. So that wouldn't make any sense. Well, here's something that's interesting. Revelation chapter 14 verses 9 through 11 says, and the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstones. In the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night, who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. What is brimstone in the Bible? Sulfur. If you burn sulfur, it produces an invisible flame. Sort of a black flame, if you will. So in other words, they could have, the fires of hell could be, if they are brimstone based, they could be invisible. You think about that. And I did a sermon, you know, probably a year or so ago on this issue and I looked up a little bit of research and they said within, you know, a couple hours, you start losing your mind in total darkness. I mean, just add that into the mix of the other ones that I've already mentioned. No water, no food, no light. Now, can you experience that here on the earth? Yeah. We're not talking about things. Hell is not some kind of a thing that is just a figment of your imagination. It's very real. And by the way, how about uh, being in a place where you smell sulfur burning for all of eternity? Just incredible. All right, uh, what's the next one? How about no sleep? You know, I don't know if you've ever gone for a time period where you have a day or so, a couple days where you don't get much sleep. It's bad. Sleep deprivation is actually a form of torture. Matthew chapter 27, verse 52 through 53, uh, it says here, And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. And then uh, we read this earlier, 1 Corinthians 15, 20 says, But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the firstfruits of them that slept. So you had the Old Testament saints. They were sleeping down there in that Abraham's bosom area, but that's gone. And those people down there, they don't have any rest. You say, how do you know that? Revelation 14.11. We read this just a few minutes ago. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night. Isn't that something? And part of the reason why you have no rest is because you will be burning. And if you're in the lake of fire, you're going to have to be basically trying to stay above the surface of that. What a terrible place. What about the next one? How about no laughter in hell? So uh, that's not too bad, really. And no place where you can't ever laugh. Bible says in Matthew twenty five thirty, and cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Did you ever, you know, have some kind of a situation where you're crying and you just keep on crying? It gets painful after a while. How about for all of eternity? Weeping and gnashing of teeth. Proverbs chapter 17 verse 22 says, A merry heart doeth good like a medicine, but a broken spirit drieth the bones. If you go through your whole life weeping, it will actually kill you. You can cry to death. You really can. Hell's not a good place. Hell's not a place that we should joke about. You know, people say, I've, I've heard, you know, professing Christians joke about hell. You know, it's hot outside, and I'll go, man, it's it's hotter than hell out there. No, it isn't. No, it isn't. 
Uh, what about number six? What's the worst part about hell? How about no escape? Being down there and realizing this is it. Forever. That's bad. Uh, Revelation 14.11, the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. Revelation 20, verse 10 says, The devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are, which they had been cast in a thousand years earlier, by the way, if you read the context, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. It never ends. Uh, look at Matthew chapter 25. I want you to see this one. Because right now a lot of people are saying, well, I, you know, I just don't believe God could create such a place. I don't believe that He would create a place and put us good people in it. Well, you're absolutely right. God didn't create hell for you. Matthew chapter 25, verse 41. Alright, it says here, Then shall He say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for people that weren't perfect and sinless. Is that what it says? No. Prepared for the devil and his angels. You know what hell was created for? Satan and his angels, the angels that fell. Right? That's what hell's for. Hell is not created for people. You say, well then when, why would God send people there? God doesn't send people to hell. People send themselves to hell by rejecting God's plan of salvation. All right? Nobody out there has to go to hell. All right, we, we talk about this a lot here, but this idiotic system of Calvinism teaches that God predestines people for hell. And they can't do anything about it. Right. Well, then why would He bring them up before judgment? You know, they could just say, well, you know, why are you judging me, God? You know, you forced me to come here. I didn't have a chance to get saved. It's a stupid system. Anytime you have a system that's named after a man, you would do well to avoid it. All right? Unless it's, you know, Christianity. Jesus Christ isn't exactly your average man, though. He's a perfect man without sin. The worst part about hell is knowing that you didn't have to go there. Knowing that there's no hope of getting out and knowing you didn't have to go there. You know, you probably all heard this story before, but I cut my thumb a few years ago. I was taking a fan apart, and I yanked the wires and went down across the housing, went right through the tenon, right into the bone. And the sad part about it is I didn't have to do that. I had gloves on, and I took my glove off, and I, you know, something in my head said, put your glove back on. Nah, I'll be all right. I'll just yank the wire quick. You know, now I get to live with a scar and a thumb that doesn't have all of its function anymore because of some stupid thing I did that wasn't necessary. And that's minor, you know, whatever, I can get by, I'm fine. But how about being in hell and realizing if I would have just read that tract, if I would have just listened to that preacher, man, that's bad. And knowing that there's no more second chances. And how many people get down here on this earth, how many lost people get multiple chance after chance after chance and they just reject the Lord? What a tragedy. If you go to hell, it's your own fault. You literally have to get by God's good graces. You know, God will provide for you. He gives you life. He'll give you food. You know, I know people have suffering and stuff like that, but God will do great things for you and He will, you know, anybody can get saved whosoever will you know i mean what's the word whosoever mean i mean we talk about it anybody can get saved i mean you literally have to fight god if you want to go to hell but now i want to cover here in the last part there are two groups of people that are going to make it into hell two different types of people all right now well the first group and i deal with these people like crazy Oh, and by the way, I want to just say one thing. Uh, I did for, almost forget to mention this on the subject of thirst and hunger. Here's a good book, uh, Sufferings in Africa by Captain James Riley. It's about a uh, sea captain that, that uh, wrecked off the coast of Africa, and they were taken actually as, and sold into slavery. You know, There's a stretch for you, North African Arabs you know, taking white men into slavery. It happened. 
and they were forced to travel through Africa with this caravan of these slave traders, and they went across the Sahara Desert, and it was so bad, the thirst and the hunger, that Captain Riley was having to stop his men from eating their own flesh. He said a couple times they were going like this and just ripping chunks off their arm just for something to eat. They were so delirious. And that's the Sahara Desert. That's not hell. You say, what's that about? Scientific proof that the conditions of hell can be experienced in minor degree here on earth. Hell is not some kind of place, a figment of our imagination. I'm not using this sermon here to get at anybody's money or to get anybody to join this church, like a lot of the wicked people out there say. But let's look at the first type of people that make it into hell. Turn to Revelation chapter 21. Now this problem is getting to be an epidemic here in America especially. I imagine all over the world there's atheists out there. But I know here in America it's just it's insane the way people hate God and just mock God it just makes me sick. Revelation chapter 21 verse 7 says here he that overcometh shall inherit all things and I will be his God and he shall be my son. That's for anybody. You can be saved. But look at verse 8. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Those people there, and you say, well, then if you're any of those things there, then you can't get into heaven. No, those people are in the lake of fire because they rejected Jesus Christ. And so they have that label put on them for all of eternity. So the first group of people that make it in there are the abominable. The people who are wicked and have no desire for the Lord. All right. Um, Second Thessalonians chapter 2. These people that uh, have no desire for the truth, you know, you try to witness to them and they laugh at you or mock you or you know, I've even heard some of the brethren getting spit on and slapped across the face. And, you know, those types of people that treat Christians that way, that, that mock the Bible. You know, I saw some, you know, I'll try to be nice. Some person on YouTube actually took an original 1611 Bible and burned it on the 400th anniversary. Those things, an original is worth over a million dollars. And a bunch of stupid atheists get together and burn a 1611 Bible. Why do they have that much hate for a book? Because the book condemns them. You know, you don't see them getting together and saying, hey, it's the anniversary of Shakespeare. Let's burn an original volume of Shakespeare. They won't do it. They want to burn the Bible because they hate the Bible. So how's God going to treat these people? Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 10. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. You have to love the truth if you want to be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Did you know God will actually send these people strong delusion so that he can damn them to hell? You don't want to get on God's bad side. Remember what we read earlier? Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord. God is long-suffering. God is patient. God is merciful. But there's a, a point in time when he's not going to be pushed anymore. And he's going to say, that's enough. You're not going to make fun of me anymore. I mean, think about it. It'd be like going outside and a little ant looking up at you and yelling at you. It's ridiculous. It's absurd. Why would you make fun of the God of the universe? And think that you can get away with it. Galatians chapter 6 verse 7 says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. You can't mock God. You think you can get away with it a little bit here on the earth, but it's going to come back. You know, there's an old saying, He who laughs last, laughs best. Now who gets the last laugh? Well, we're going to look about that. Proverbs chapter 1 I'm going to show you a, a picture of God Almighty here that is so foreign to the average modern Christian 
that they're going to deny what I have to say. And you'll get that. You know, I've gotten into things with, you know, debates with these modern Christians and they'll say they can see it plainly right there in Scripture and they'll say, I don't believe it. Because it, it goes against how they've been taught about this nice guy up in heaven that, that just loves everybody unconditionally. That's not the God of the Bible. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 22. That's where we're going to start out. Notice a couple of things here too as we continue. How long, ye simple ones, will ye love simplicity, and the scorners delight in their scorning, and fools hate knowledge? Remember what we read earlier there? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. So what do you have as a fool? A fool does not fear God. Verse 23, Turn you at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you. I will make known my words unto you. So when God reproves you for your sin, you should turn to him. Verse 24, Because I have called and ye refused, I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded, but ye have set at naught all my counsel and would none of my reproof. Now look at the next verse. I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh. Let me continue. Verse 27. When your fear cometh as desolation, and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish cometh upon you, then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. For that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. They would none of my counsel. They despised all my reproof. Therefore shall they eat of the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices. For the turning away of the simple shall slay them and the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. But whoso hearkeneth unto me shall dwell safely and shall be quiet from fear of evil. Is it a situation here where God does not Give them any kind of mercy? No. God is saying, a time and time again, I've reached out to these people, and all they do is make fun of me. And how they end up. I want you to picture that for a minute. At the great white throne judgment. And here you have this prominent atheist up there that mocked God and made fun of God. I had a comment on one of my videos. A guy called uh, God a sky fairy. Now you think about that when that little jerk stands in front of Almighty God. And he's there and he's looking down. The Bible says about at the great white throne judgment from whose face the heaven and earth fled away. Okay, the earth is destroyed before the great white throne judgment. And I believe, you know, Dr. Ruckman teaches this and I think he's probably right. I believe that while this judgment happens, there is literally nothing underneath them but hell, but the lake of fire. Now, can you imagine that? They're standing there, you know, before this God whose voice is compared to thunder. And they're standing there and they're looking down into the lake of fire under their feet. And they're there going, Oh God, please, please, one more chance. Please give me another chance. Oh God, please don't send me down there. Please, please. And God, Almighty God, Creator of the heaven and earth, is up there going, Oh, please, please, please. Making fun of them. That's your loving God for you. You say, well, how can, how can you say that that's love? He tried time and time again. I stretched out my hand. Please turn at my reproof. Repent. Come to me, all you, that are heavy, uh, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come. You know? No, no, you know, whatever, whatever. That's where you're going to end up. All right? What an amazing thing. What about the second group of people that go to hell? Well, this is the one that I would say is tragic. Honestly, I don't have a whole lot of sympathy for somebody that mocks God. You know, when I deal with these atheists, they start there making fun of my God, my Lord. I'm just like, whatever. You know what? You, you want to make fun of my salvation message I put out there that I took my time to put out and I want people to listen to it and I want people to get saved. And if you get saved, you contact me. I'll send you a free Bible. Send you all this stuff. You want to make fun of me for that? All right. I'm going to make fun of you. I'm not going to show respect. I'm not going to, you know, oh, please, please. No. Hey, what do you what do you think is going to happen to you if you reject Jesus Christ? You're going to go to hell. That's it. I'm trying to witness to you. 
you don't want to accept it, go to hell. Simple as that. But what about the second group? This is the group where you read about where God is actually grieved. Turn to Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 33. Go towards the New Testament there, Isaiah, Jeremiah. And then you hit the Ecclesiastes, I think is between the two. Go to Ezekiel chapter 33. You know, a lot of times we like to have you know a good time here at Bible Believers Fellowship, but this is this is a sermon that is not a good time. This is bad. This is not a funny matter. Ezekiel chapter thirty three verse eleven. Okay, it says here, say unto them, as I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways. For why will ye die, O house of Israel? Now that's true for the Jews, it's true for the house of Israel, but it's also true for anybody. God has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. When they get past that point where he turns them over to a reprobate mind, and he sends them strong delusion so he can damn them to hell, I still don't think he has pleasure in damning them to hell, but he'll mock them at that point. But I'll tell you right now, the majority of people that go to hell are what we would call, quote-unquote, good people people i mean we've all i'm sure we all can name people that we know that are good people morally they live very good lives i mean i'm going to be real straight with you a lot of times i'll trust lost businessmen before i'll trust quote-unquote christian businessmen i've met people that profess to be saved and they are crooked in their dealings and i've met guys that are rough and tough and you know on their way to hell and they'll they'll do you right in business. You know, there's a lot of good people out there. And I think that it grieves the Lord's heart. But what's the condition there? What do you see? Turn from your evil ways. And there's a whole modern movement now within the body of Christ that says you don't have to repent before you get saved. Just believe and receive. Just pray this magical prayer and you're in. It's not what the Bible says. There needs to be an understanding there that you are a sinner and that you deserve to go to hell and that your only way out is Jesus Christ. You turn from your self-righteousness and you turn to the Lord and you accept His plan of salvation, not your own. Not, well, I'm a good person. I, all those horrible things about hell, I can't imagine God would put me through that. No, you don't think that way. Jesus Christ. I mean, I, I had a guy tell me that the one time. I was witnessing to this tough guy down in West Virginia. And he said, oh, I think I'll make it. I think I'm going to be good enough. I said, okay. Did Jesus die on the cross? Yeah. And I said, why did he die? If you can be good enough to get to heaven, if you can be good enough to earn your way in, why did Jesus Christ die on the cross? Well, you know, let's change the subject. Yeah, you better change the subject. But you see, that tough guy realized that if he gets saved... His buddies are going to make fun of him. What a stupid reason for going to hell. And yet that's what a lot of men do. You know, I don't want to be one of those little goody two-shoes, little Christian. So out of their cowardice, because they don't want to be a Christian in front of their friends, they live their whole life and die and go to hell. And burn and suffer the worst torment that you, can, you can't even imagine how bad it's going to be. One other place here to turn to and then we're done. Second Peter chapter 3. Second Peter chapter three, back to the New Testament. Second Peter chapter three, verse nine. All right, it says here, "The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish." but that all should come to repentance. Okay? God has promised some things. Think about what you have here in front of you. God has written down exactly what's going to happen in the future. Wrote it down and put it in a book. 
And he says, these are my promises. This is exactly what's going to happen. And all these atheists, it cracks me up. You know, they're trying to say, oh, the Bible's not scientific and all this stuff. The Bible is scientific. Absolutely, totally scientific. Hell is a scientific reality. And the Bible gives something that's very interesting. Um, I think it's actually... Uh, yeah, actually back in chapter 1, um, verse 19, it says, we, also, we have also a more sure word of prophecy. We have a more sure word of prophecy here in our King James Bible. It tells us exactly what's going to happen in the future. So this Bible is not only scientific, but it's also pre-recorded history. And this Bible talks about a place called hell. And God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Anybody out there can get saved. There's no reason to not get saved. Alright? So now to conclude this sermon, I just want to say a couple of things here. If you are lost, and you've listened to this sermon, you need to understand that you have to turn, as we read earlier, turn from your self-righteousness. That's why a lot of people go to hell, because they think that they're not that bad. You know, I mean, you go out and you do door-to-door -door work, that's the number one thing you're going to hear. You know, if you died tonight, do you think that you'd go to heaven? Well, I think I'll make it in. Well, why is that? Well, I'm not that bad of a person. I mean, I've never killed anybody. That's what people will say. Sorry, it doesn't work. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So you need to turn from your self-righteousness. I can't, you know, one of the reasons I'm not yelling and screaming and trying to get you all scared emotionally is because I don't want you to come to a false salvation. You have to come to a place where you realize I'm a sinner and I can't make it in on my own. You have to turn from your own self-righteousness. Next, you have to go to Jesus Christ and realize that He died for sinners. Jesus didn't come to this earth and die for good people. He came for sinners. God loved you enough to send His Son to die for your sins. Understand that. Yes, there is the terror of the Lord. Yes, God has created this place called hell and evil people that refuse to repent. They're going to go there. And it's going to be horrible for them. But His love was manifest in Him giving His Son to die for your sins. It's very important to understand that. And you can receive that free gift of salvation today. There's no reason that you can't be saved. Now, if you listen to this message and you say, well, I really don't know for sure, get it straightened out. You say, well, I, you know, I got work tomorrow and I got a big meeting and stuff like that. Hey, everything is secondary. How many of those people do you think out there in the Midwest right now that were killed in this, with these tornadoes that hit, how many of them do you think expected to be killed? Zero. They weren't, they weren't thinking that they were going to be killed. You know, I heard the story. There was a little two-year-old boy that was found out in a field. And they went and they, you know, I guess he was bruised up or whatever. And they got him and they tried to find out who his family was. Turned out his whole family, mom and dad and other, you know, brother or something, they were all killed. He was the only one that survived. Do you think he expected that? No. Do you think the father and the mother expected to die? No. It can happen like that. It can happen so quick. Hey, we could go to war with Iran and Russia could say, and China, they could get together and say, let's just nuke America. Let's just level it. And I hate to tell you this, uh, brethren, uh, people out there listening, America is not mentioned in Bible prophecy. There is no great power in the West. It's not there. Could something happen to America before the time of Jacob's trouble, the tribulation comes? Very possible. Better make sure that you're saved. Better make sure that you're not going to end up in that horrible place called hell. Better make sure that you don't end up down there and say, I didn't have to come here. But you say, well, you know, I'm, I'm a Christian. I don't have to worry about it. Whew, you know, I'm, I'm glad I got out of hell. Well, I am. Amen. You know, praise the Lord, I'm not going to hell. But let me ask you something, Christian. How real is hell to you? How often do you think about it? I'll confess a fault here openly. Hell is really not that real to me. When I have chances to witness and I keep my mouth shut, hell's really not that real. I'll tell you what, it's convicting. It's really convicting. I mean, I want you to think about something. Let's say you're driving down the road and you see this house on fire 
and you pull over and you get out of your vehicle, and just as soon as you get out, you hear the screams of men and women from inside that home. And you say, you know, what can we do? There's nothing we can do. It's too late. You mean to tell me you'd say, oh, well, i got to get going. You get in your car and you leave and you never think about it again? No. I think you'd probably stay awake at night remembering them screams. It'd be a horrible thing. Well, we can't hear the screams of hell. But I'll tell you what, it's a real place. The Bible proves it. Science proves it. It's right under your feet. Right now, right down there, there's millions, probably, well, not millions, billions of souls in hell, weeping, wailing, gnashing of teeth. How often do you think about hell? And you're witnessing to the lost. you got to realize those people are going there. You can't force people to get saved, but you have to witness to them. You know, again, I, I've been slacking on the whole thing of putting tracks out. I'll confess another fault. I get busy, you know. But man, I got to get back into it. I mean, we were talking about it, you know, about tracting and things. It's like, got to get back to it. Well, the people won't listen. Doesn't matter. You got to warn them. Something to think about there. So we're going to close with a, a word of prayer here. But uh, don't ever joke about hell. Don't ever laugh at hell. Somebody tells you a joke about hell, you need to say to them, you know what, that's not funny. Hell's not a funny place. Hell's not a joke. Don't ever use hell as just a, the word hell as some funny little thing. But let's close here in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, uh, thank You for Your Word, Lord, first and foremost, because without it we would just be in the dark. Thy Word is a light and a lamp. The Bible talks about back in uh, Psalms. What an amazing thing that you have provided such an easy way out of hell through salvation, through Jesus Christ, just by faith, Lord. We don't have to travel around the world and, and keep some you know, laws or anything like that. Just belief. Just coming to you as a sinner, as we are, as you already know we are, and just having faith that Jesus Christ's death on the cross is enough to pay for those sins. And we're out of it. It's just that simple, Lord. And so I pray, Lord, if there, if there were any unsaved people that have listened to this message, I pray that they would get in contact with us, that they would go to our main website and watch the salvation message and see how easy it is to be saved, that they would not delay their salvation for any longer, or that they would get saved as quickly as they can, Lord. Help them to realize the urgency of salvation. And I just pray, Lord, for the Christians out there. I pray for myself also, Lord. I'm not perfect. You know how I am. I pray that we would not look at people out there and, and see fear, be afraid to, that they'll laugh at us or whatever. I pray that we would see them as a soul that's on their way to hell, as a soul that's in a burning building or that's heading into a burning building, and we need a witness to them. Help us to do it in the right spirit, Lord. Help us to realize that we can't force people to be saved. We can witness to them. We can warn them about hell. But it's up to them, Lord. It's between them and you. So I just pray, Lord, that we would be faithful in our witnessing and uh, that we would spend our time, Lord, that we would labor knowing the terror of the Lord and uh, that we would persuade men, as your word says. So I just pray all these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. If these sermons or videos have been a blessing to you, please help us to continue this work by supporting this ministry. You can send a check payable to Brian Denlinger to King James Video Ministries, P.O. Box 300, Bradford, PA, 16701. Or you can donate online through PayPal at our website, www.kingjamesvideoministries.com. Thank you, and may the Lord Jesus Christ bless you.